on almost one of the very first days that I came in there, a young girl who had been dragged behind a vehicle in an altercation between police and terrorists had lost half of her backside and her back and both of her legs. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Point, right? you're you're going to I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the top of us. She did say, you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. I'm Sharon Maskell-Dare, and you're listening to Life on the Line in collaboration with StoryWrite, dedicated to empowering veterans one story at a time. In today's podcast, we meet Emma Grigson, a former Army medical officer who has a story of personal courage in overcoming adversity. She also talks about the importance of family. Today, Emma is a full-time mum, and she's also volunteering to help other veterans. So Emma, thank you very much for joining us on Life on the Line. No problem at all, Sharon. Really happy to be here. So tell us about your early years. You did grow up here in Adelaide. Yes, I did. I grew up in the northern suburbs of Salisbury and Elizabeth, the youngest of two daughters with a very wonderful mother and very wonderful father. And what was your childhood like? I mean, was there much kind of military influence for you when you were when you were younger? Actually, no. My mother is a nurse who specialises in palliative care and my father was a swimmer for Australia before he took a job with what was then known as Social Security and went on later to become Centrelink. He investigated fraud and they both worked extremely hard and studied quite hard all through my early years of life. Goodness me, your dad swam for Australia. Tell us a bit more about that. He did, yes. He specialised in butterfly and breaststroke and was selected on the teams for Commonwealth and Olympic training, but did have to give it up. The um, joys of real life and having to have children, get married, those sorts of things got in the way. We'll get to your own sort of sporting prowess uh, later in the podcast, but uh, just tell us a bit more then about life when you were growing up. I mean, you talk about growing up in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. What did that mean for you? The northern suburbs of Adelaide don't have the greatest reputation. We did move quite a lot when I was younger. We did have quite a bit of assistance from lots of very lovely organisations. We did live in a fair bit of undesirable housing, government housing, sometimes moving housing because a lot of undesirable people weren't quite happy with my father's job and his line of work. But we always had a roof over our heads and my parents always provided for us, which was absolutely magnificent, always made sure that we never really wanted for anything, which I, to this day, still am really thankful for and really grateful for. And there was an incident when you were growing up. Would you be happy to share that with us? Yes. Uh, so on the 20th of May, 1992, a Wednesday, unfortunately, because my parents both worked very long hours, my sister and I coming home from school, caught the bus home from school and went to go get ourselves some dinner from the local shop, which you could do in those days. Things were much safer and much nicer. On the walk back home, a gentleman who was under the influence of some drugs crashed into us and unfortunately my sister was killed in the accident. She was um, 11 years old and I was eight at the time. I'm so sorry to hear that, Emma. That must have had a significant impact on your family. It absolutely did. So it was a horrible accident. It really did shatter the little community that we lived in at the time. We lived in a little suburb called Ross Trevor at the time, actually. We'd moved out of Salisbury and Elizabeth at the time. We lived in Ross Trevor. But we did have a, a great little community that did try and pull together. It obviously shattered my mother and my father was obviously very upset at the time as well. And it did it did shatter myself as well, just being eight years old. Very difficult to process, very hard to get over. So what happened from there? How did it affect your schooling, for example? I think for everyone in the family, it was a bit of a, a bit of a change. We 
we upped and relocated. Very difficult for my family to stay in that location anymore. So we upped and relocated. I went to a new school, so I changed schools. My family took a little bit of time out. We did some travel around, getting ourselves feeling better. My mum was quite unwell for a little period of time. I found a new position in the family whereby my father and I took care of my mum a little bit. I found myself being, I guess, a little bit more of an equal amongst my family, which I actually believe was a really great a great thing. My parents and I became a lot closer and I guess I focused a lot more on school and the opportunities that I had. I didn't want to take anything for granted. I wanted to make sure that the opportunities I had that my sister Kate did not have, I didn't take them for granted and I made the most of every single opportunity that I had. And you talk about making the most of opportunities because you then ended up going to the Australian Defence Force Academy and becoming a helicopter pilot. I mean, that's an incredible achievement. Thank you. Yes. So I went to ADFA, so the Australian Defence Force Academy. I studied there for three years and then went to the Royal Military College for a year. And whilst I was at Royal Military College, went through the testing and was selected to be pilot. It was myself and another girl called Fiona. And we were the two ladies selected to be pilots. And yeah, in end of 2004, we graduated as pilots into the um, Australian Army Aviation Corps. So did you actually get to fly helicopters? Funnily enough, when you join the Army Aviation Corps, you start on fixed wing aircraft, CT4s, down at Tamworth. So we did all of that training. At the end of that training, they bring down helicopters for you to have a chance on. I had always wanted to fly the Huey. It was my favourite aircraft. On my last day of training, before I actually left to come back home here to Adelaide for a compassionate posting, they brought down the helicopters and I had an opportunity to fly Huey and I loved it. And the gentleman at the time said, oh, you're actually very good at this. Can't wait to see you up at Oki. And I actually said to him, actually, I leave tomorrow. (laughs) So I got to fly a Huey once, but I did get to fly the CT4 several times, which was, well, more than several times. But yeah, it it was extremely fun. And just tell us a bit about the complexity involved in that, because, I mean, for people not familiar with the world of aviation, flying a helicopter, I mean, I've heard it sort of, you know, compared to rub your head and rub your tummy and do weird things with your feet all at the same time. I mean, it's a real feat of coordination, isn't it? Yes, flying is extremely difficult. It is something you have to practice continually, study continually. We think often as mothers that we are multitasking, but it's nothing compared to flying. Constantly, you've got one hand doing one thing, one hand doing another thing while your brain's trying to remember about an airfield or about what's going on with your instruments. So it is a very complex task. And to the people who do it every single day in and out, it's, you know, hats off to them for what they do. But that ended up not being your destiny. You then moved on to a different course. I did. I did. As I said, I stopped my training in August 2005. My father became quite ill. And so my mind was not on my aviation training, which they were very quick to identify. They're very good at that. And so back home to Adelaide, I came originally on a compassionate posting and helped nurse my father who was quite ill here in Adelaide. And how long were you here for? Originally, it was meant to be a six-month posting. I ended up staying for 18 months when I increased that posting from a six-month compassionate posting to another year worth of a normal posting with a transfer from Aviation Corps to Medical Corps. So why did you decide to choose Medical Corps? What was it about that work that appealed to you? Medical Corps had actually been my second preference when I was at the Royal Military College. Medical had always appealed to me, I guess, having a mother who had worked in nursing for all of my life and seeing her dedicate herself to palliative care, especially in the wake of my sister's death and her compassion in the field of medical science has always been a real inspiration to me. So having the opportunity to work with medical specialists and in a way show that compassion, but within the military environment. I found quite compelling. And when I came down here and worked on my compassionate posting with the medical specialists here at 3HSB in Adelaide, I was again inspired by their compassionate natures and their nurturing natures, but within a military environment. I found that very, very inspirational. So I had no hesitation that when I wanted to stay and when I knew my mind was more with my father than with helicopter training, it was an easy decision to make. So I have to ask, I mean, in any way, those skills that you'd, you'd learnt as a helicopter pilot, 
that coordination, that ability to digest huge amounts of information and, and understand, you know, that the workings of a rotary wing aircraft. Did that in any way translate across to medicine? It was a CT4, so I just have to correct that there. But I don't think that it translated. I think it was just that it was a passion. The passion for the aircraft was no longer there, but the passion for working with very highly intelligent and highly passionate people that transferred over. So the passionate people in Aviation Corps, you have to be passionate about what it is that you're doing. And then these highly passionate and intelligent people in Medical Corps. So my desire to work with these types of people, that absolutely transferred over. And I mean, it's intoxicating working with people who are so dedicated, who are so passionate, who are so intelligent, it rubs off on you and you just want to be around them. How did you find the training in medicine? Did you take to it relatively easily? So you don't have to do any specific medical training to be in medical corps as a GSO, a general service officer, but I had the strong desire to do so. So I started off doing a little bit of nursing study than I did back then what was a CFA course that has now been taken over by basic medical courses. But back then you could do CFA courses, which just dabbled a little bit in what basic medics do. You could do a CFL course, which is your combat fitness leaders course. So I dabbled a little bit in all of the little parts of what medical corps do. I wanted to have a broad understanding of all of the little things that Medical Corps encompassed. Yeah, I think it was really just all of these people and what they did and what they did with such passion. I wanted to have an understanding. So yeah, that did, that rubbed off a little bit and I just wanted to be a part of it. CFA, that's combat first aid? Combat first aid, yes. Sorry. So what was it like learning those sorts of skills? Back in 2005, 2006, before there were as harsh regulations, that was very exciting. It was a lot of medics practicing their skills of needles, a lot of them being very scared about practicing on the boss, but it was great. You know, you were learning skills that in the real world could help people. And I think there's something really delightful about knowing that if something goes wrong, you can actually do something about it you know, more so than just calling a number or perhaps doing some CPR, you can you can do something more and having a little bit of knowledge and knowing that you can help, there's just something really delightful about that. Tell us then a bit more about the work you did once you had transferred over to Medical Corps. Where did you find yourself posted in Australia? So most of the work I did had to do with the operations part, so training, resources, some of the policy work. So my first posting after 3HSB as their operations officer down here in Adelaide, I went up to Darwin. I did platoon commander time where I got to do a lot of work with environmental health officers. Mark Tamblin was a huge influence on me, but then there were a lot of soldiers down there up in Darwin who were absolutely fantastic to work with. I learned a lot from them about the impacts on the environment. So that was absolutely fantastic. I headed across to Townsville to 3 Sisby, who back then health units were involved very closely with logistics. This was before they were removed from logistics units. And again, just learning a lot about the operations, resourcing, finances, training. So a whole host of the different aspects of what goes on with health and all of the specialties. So doctors, nurses, medics, physiotherapists, psychologists, environmental health specialists, the drivers, a whole range of different tasks and people. And at some point you got exposed to jungle warfare. Tell us a bit about that. I did. That was while I was at 3 Sisby up in Townsville. So we went on the Rifle Company Butterworth trip to Malaysia. Usually it goes for three months. Ours ended up going for a little bit longer. We came down with swine flu while we were over there and got held over and quarantined for quite a while in Johor Bahru, which is a little wild west town in south of Malaysia. And we did jungle warfare training down there with Malaysian troops. And as the training officer, I got to run the scenarios, weapons training, etc., and got exposed myself to jungle warfare training. And it was an excellent experience with one RAR and one regiment, which are the artillery regiment that's there. So for people who are not initiated, what does jungle warfare training involve? To put it simply, a lot of not being able to see what you can do trying to walk up very, very steep hills and through ground cover and trees that are very, very close together. A lot of mosquitoes, a lot of 
blood sucking insects that want to stick to you and leech everything out of you. A lot of very sleepless nights, spiders and snakes. Wow, that sounds pretty unpleasant. (laughs) Unpleasant, but a lot of fun and with the right amount of people, a lot of learning to be done. So what was the highlight for you of, of undertaking that kind of training? Eating monkey. Eating monkey? Yes, eating monkey and goanna um, were probably some highlights of that. So what, what's it like, eating monkey? It feels slightly cannibalistic, but at the same time, I can understand how it might be slightly appealing. You developed a taste for monkey. I would not say I developed a taste, but I can understand how if you um, are hungry, it can be slightly appealing. Yes. So after that jungle warfare experience, I mean, you ended up deploying. I mean, you seem to be on a quite a trajectory at this time. You were going from kind of one experience to the next. Yes. So after three CISB, I posted to the Royal Military College as an instructor where I was lucky enough to instruct for several months before I then picked up a deployment, an actual health-based deployment of which are few and far between to Afghanistan. And I went over as a health advisor to the 205th Hero National Corps. So it was a divisional headquarters advisory job in the southern parts of Afghanistan. Tell us about that experience of when you arrived in the Middle East for the first time. Was it your first time over there? It was, yes. I arrived. My boss at the time was a gentleman called Colonel John Simeone, who I had worked with previously. He had actually grown the role, which was absolutely fantastic. And as I said, it was an actual health specific role, which was also absolutely fantastic. And I was advising Colonel Hakim, who was in charge of all of the medical operations and logistics for the whole of Southern Afghanistan. So Kandahar province, Helmand province, Sabul province. I'm forgetting a couple of other provinces there at the moment, but that's okay. But he was in charge of all of the operations, training, logistics, health-wise to do with the whole of southern Afghanistan. So it was an absolutely fantastic experience. Very intimidating at first, but a huge task, very rewarding task as well. So to what extent were you actually involved in, in the realities of what was going on in Afghanistan at that time? And to what extent were you in a headquarters? So we spent the majority majority, I would probably say, of our time going out. So we would visit forward operating bases of the Afghanis to make sure that their training programs were working correctly, that their medical logistics were out there correctly. We would visit the logistics bases to make sure that supplies were getting to where they needed to go. We did a lot of visits out to make sure that doctors were where they needed to go. One of the major problems that were facing the military forces in southern Afghanistan was that a lot of the medical forces, doctors primarily, didn't want to be away from the capital. In the capital, Kabul, they would earn the most money, whereas in the southern fighting areas, they would earn less money. So we had the not so easy task of trying to convince doctors that they wanted to be out in those southern provinces and out at forward operating bases, so Afghan doctors be out in those forward operating bases in the southern parts of Afghanistan providing help. And then we had the dubious task of convincing General Yafatali, who was in charge of all of the medical Afghan military forces in the whole of Afghanistan, that he needed to pay them commiserate with what that job was. And that was a challenge? It was. It was definitely a challenge. We weren't quite there by the time I finished my deployment, but we were definitely on the road to getting there. So to what extent did you have contact with people who were seeking medical help as well as those who were offering the medical help? So we did have a fair bit of contact with people seeking medical help. I worked mostly with Afghan forces as opposed to coalition forces. So we did see a lot of children, women seeking medical help from Afghan facilities. There was a physical therapy facility, for example, run by the women nurses. And there were a lot of children, women and men who would come there after they'd had an amputation or likewise. So they would seek help in trying to learn to walk again or for a prosthetic limb for the children, for example, so they could walk properly, those sorts of things. It must have been quite harrowing having to come across that every day. 
It was quite harrowing. We had quite a few who might be multiple amputees who would come through as well. So they were always difficult times when you'd have multiples or especially very young children and especially in community outreach programs that we went to quite a few of, you know, when you would see young children or the elderly who can sometimes find it far more difficult to access the resources or the medications or the help that they need. You always want to help people and sometimes you don't have the resources, the time or the money to help everybody. So that's always quite a challenge. So how did you deal with that frustration, that sense of wanting to do more and knowing that sometimes you couldn't? Sometimes the frustration gets to you. I did a lot of running on a treadmill in a Connex container in a lot of very hot days to do with frustration. Sometimes we could have more practical solutions. One of the things we found was that morphine would get stolen to be sold on the black market and it would be replaced with water, which is obviously very dangerous from a medical point of view. So we could have more practical solutions like providing more secure forms of logistical transport to get morphine to where it needs to go. So practical solutions were obviously the best, but on days when practical solutions couldn't be found, running in a Connex container in hot weather was excellent form of release as well. And I imagine there must be some stories that have stayed with you of the people that you met and the particular cases that you came across. Absolutely. If I may, I am happy to share one with you that will probably stay with me forever. On almost one of the very first days that I came in there, a young girl who had been dragged behind a vehicle in an altercation between police and terrorists had lost half of her backside and her back and both of her legs. Now, this could mean almost certain death because a way to not be able to defecate properly and manage your food would mean almost certain death from disease control and infection. But her father would walk this young girl in each day until we were able to find a spot to get her in. And we rebuilt, not me personally, obviously, I'm not a surgeon, but the team rebuilt her entire back area and found a solution so that she was able to be free from infection. By the end of my deployment, she was released back into her very, very protective father's arms and she was coming back in almost every day and he would literally walk her in every single day. And the look on his face, his gratitude and his love for his daughter, who was, by the way, the youngest of, I think it was nine children, was just amazing to see. And good stories like that, I think, stay every single day with me. Not all of them were good like that, but that that one will stay with me every single day. Her horrific injuries were horrible, but the good result and the good outcome, I think, will stay with me every day. And now as a mother of two small children, I can see his immense dedication and his immense gratitude to what people did, and I can really sympathise with that. So when you left Afghanistan, you must have felt that some regret in some way that you were leaving after having had such close connection with so many of the people there at the same time as obviously wanting to come home. I did. I did feel a lot of regret. I was very close with Colonel Hakim, who is my Afghan person that I worked very closely with and a number of other people, my interpreter I was very close with, and his family, they put themselves at a lot of risk to help look after us and help us in what we were doing. So I did feel very close to them, and there were lots of things that I wanted to finish that you can't always get to see to completion. But I had an excellent job to come home to, and I had my mother waiting at home for me, so I needed to come home. Did you have the traditional homecoming? I mean, were there banners at the airport? No, there was not. (laughs) My mum was very late. (laughs) I waited at the airport for a a good little while until I saw her, but there were many tears. (laughs) And then you moved on in time to work in intelligence. So tell us a bit about how that came about. Between coming home from Afghanistan and getting to intelligence, I met my husband and then I became pregnant and had my first son. And I guess my life took a new direction. I had some new focuses being my family and I made some decisions that I'd like to put my family first. I guess having really had those experiences when I was much younger, that family needed to be important and having had those experiences I'd seen overseas about how important family needs to be. I had some great opportunities coming forward in in health, but I wanted to make some decisions that would keep my family together. 
there were some great opportunities going in a plan called Plan Proteus to have some experiences in intelligence. And so I put my hand up for that and gave that a go. And what was your role? What were you required to do? So originally I went to 5RAR up in Darwin as their intelligence officer. So you went from medicine to intelligence. So tell us more about how that came about because they are quite different skill sets or is it that you can't tell us very much about what you did? I'd love to be able to use that line if I tell you I have to kill you, but that's not quite the case. So I did my intelligence training whilst I was actually pregnant with my first child. That is an interesting experience. Probably can't tell you most of that because probably I I would have to kill you for that because that's embarrassing mostly. A pregnant lady doing intelligence training is probably not a great look. But I went up to 5RAR and I was their intelligence officer and It seems like a huge change, but a lot of the time you're dealing in relationships and I think that you're either good at relationships or you're bad at relationships and I seemed to have developed a good way of dealing in relationships and so those skills seemed to be what intelligence were after at the time and I was able to use those skills. Did you deploy with those skills? I didn't deploy. I was... Uh, still in the throes of a newborn bubble. My son was only a few months old at that point in time. Not quite as family friendly as I thought, which I was later to learn, but still a very rewarding experience up there at 5RR with a very excellent intelligence team below me. We did a lot of training. We did a lot of support to what went on. We also got involved in the very first exercise Kawari, which is the trilateral engagement between Australia, China and the US. Now, one thing we haven't talked about, but we did flag at the beginning of today's podcast, is your sporting background in the Army. In that you mentioned earlier about your father being a champion swimmer and swimming for Australia. What you haven't told us, of course, is that at one point, weren't you some kind of ambassador for Nike? When we were looking for images of you on the Defence Image Gallery, we actually found a whole bunch of photos of you posing in Nike gear. So tell us a bit about that. So in 2012, Nike decided that they wanted to encourage women to become more proactive about sports. There'd been a lot of violence against women running at night time and women were beginning to pull away from being involved in sports. And they put a call out for people who were very big in sports. And at the time, I was very huge into running. I'd been doing running for quite a long time. I'd been doing gym work for quite a long time. I'd done quite a lot of races, those sorts of things. And so I put my hand up and became one of the ambassadors for the very first ever Nike She Runs the Night, aimed towards encouraging women to get out, get into sports take back the night time, take back the power of getting into sports as a way of showing that we can do it. Whether you're with a friend, whether you're on your own, it's safe. You can do sports. You can make time for it. You know, women often, we get busy. We have families. We have work. We don't make the time for ourselves. So it was was to encourage doing that. I've always been big into sports, whether it was rugby, whether it was running, whether it was swimming. So it was great to be a part of that. Now, today you're a full-time mum. And you're also very involved in the veterans community here in South Australia. And interestingly, you've just taken up a a new role which draws on that incredible sporting background you have. So tell us a bit about that. I have recently started up with the Australian Institute of Sport with their executive talent program. So again, it's about empowering women to come forward within the executive sporting world and sector and just encourage women to take more of a leadership role. I'm very passionate about women in sport, obviously, doing it for quite a while. Within an environment like defence where men make up the majority of it, often women can get lost or feel tokenistic. So it's great to be a part of such a program as this where, again, men make up such a majority in sport and I don't want to take anything away from them because they do great. But let's get some women up there and doing great things as well. So it's great to be a part of something like this again as well and continue on that journey again as well. And you're also getting very involved in the veteran community here. So so tell us why that's so important to you, to give back in some way. I think it's important to me. I have a husband who's a veteran. I'm a veteran. I think it's really important to understand that veterans always have a choice. We can be choosing to be victims or be seen as victims. And 
we can be seen as, you know, those old crusty veterans that everyone remembers. And I think it's it's great to be changing the conversation from that to, you no, know, a lot of veterans are young and we're happy and we're positive and, you know, we want to be out there making a change and be part of our communities. And, you know, we don't want people to be scared of us or worried about us or, you know, always seeing us as victims. We'd like people to see us for who we are, what we've got to offer and, I guess, be really engaged with us. There are a lot of great programs out there at the moment. You've got employment programs out there. You've got people recognising the input veterans can make. And I think just being a part of that and sort of helping change that conversation and that perception of veterans is a really great thing to be a part of. Well, Emma, thank you very much for what you're doing in the veterans community right here and right now. Thanks, Sharon. Emma Grigson, thank you very much. You've been listening to Life on the Line in collaboration with StoryWrite. I'm Sharon Maskeldare. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed Sharon's conversation with Emma. To see photos of Emma, you can visit our website, www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. While you're there, subscribe to our e-newsletter. You can also find photos of our guests like Emma in uniform and on deployment on our social media, at LOTLpod on Twitter and at Life on the Line Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. We are, of course, releasing this episode a couple of days out from Anzac Day. I hope for all listening that it's a special day of commemoration and reflection for you and your family. And have fun with the two-up, of course, responsible or otherwise. Last year, I did a bonus episode with highlights from my 2018 Anzac Day experience. If you missed it, go back to Season 2 and have a listen. To mark Anzac Day this year, we're closing out the episode between Emma and Sharon with something a bit different. A song. The song War by John Lynham was inspired and written after he met Bo Rutledge, a then 23-year-old Afghanistan veteran. John is asking for any Afghanistan veterans with photos or videos they're willing to share to contact him by looking up his Facebook page, John Lynham Music. He's collecting these for a special project. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Theme music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening. And, as always, lest we forget. to his eyes From that day he kissed his mother goodbye He knew it was no game And when he landed there he never felt so much fear in the air He didn't sleep that first night And nothing seemed to change Nine years on it gets dark and it's the same The fear burned in his eyes And the scars left in his mind They start to ease the more he drinks his homemade wine He's standing at the bar With his back against the wall This bloke told me he was back from the Afghan War
He's just another Aussie boy who's been to the war. 